If you scan these QR codes, you will get one of my works. My sculptures take physical form, but also digital form. I like to use AR as a way of disseminating sculptures around the world, especially in this time when everyone is very separate from each other. I um, primarily have spent the last two years working in blockchain, specifically around NFTs and institutional, which I guess we'll define shortly, archivability and looking at legacy from the standpoint of technology. And as an artist, I've worked pretty extensively with technology as a medium. Most recently, I've sort of been using technology as a way to interpret or renegotiate portraiture with the removal of the figure and using technology as sort of the narrative or the diary which informs the work. I'm the founder of Transfer, which is an experimental gallery focused on simulation and expanded practice. We've been doing this kind of work since 2013. Um, at the gallery, we've focused on physical exhibitions, serving as sort of a site of R&D and development for the next generation of artists working with technology. Starting back in 2016, I also began to partner with institutions. You see an example of that here. It's an immersive room scale installation, and a viewer actually comes into the room and can control the entire playlist by the iPad there in the center. So I just want to acknowledge Lumi's slide here of the incredible show that's on view right now, which I was so happy to catch when I was in New York with E. Jane, where there's love overflowing. This amazing slide that Rebecca sent in of an ad for a workshop at EAI on using the Apple II in the late 70s. And this, uh, the brochure is part of the archival materials that are now collated on EAI's website that people can go and check out if they wanna learn more about the early history of computer art. So the question I just wanna put forward is before we have this whole conversation about digital art and its relationship to institutions is what do we even mean by institution? What makes an institution? Is it time? Is it mandate? Is it the community it serves? I don't know. EAI is at this fulcrum that I think is interesting. It was founded with an anti-institutional ethos driving it. It was anti the institution of corporate television and the commercial art world and was really wanting to be an alternative paradigm that fostered artistic experimentation outside of those institutional contexts. But at the same time, the founder was very clear about EAI being an institution to support artists. But obviously, what kind of institution is perhaps the question? To me, that's like really anything that kind of just creates a structure, like an organizing structure for these works to be seen. Once those those works are seen, they become like institutionalized to their specific publics that they're serving. The, the narrative that we have and, you know, institutions like EAI have stuck around long enough to sort of see this whole trajectory is that by the time you get into the 80s with the advent of personal computing and then into the 90s with the advent of the internet and prosumer technologies, artists are no longer reliant upon these institutions in order to either produce or share their artwork. Okay, we know that shift happened. What was gained and what was lost? Being there in the early 90s that and, and mid 90s where there was a general attitude of institutions being unnecessary because it felt like the work that was being done could not be supported by those institutions, which were slow moving and couldn't really archive what was done and the incapability of the institution to even keep up with what was going on. I'd say that's one thing that was gained. It wasn't just a independence from the institution. It was a, it was a freeing of the mind to, to imagine a world without institutions, you know, and I thought that was really valuable at that moment. I think that the story becomes a lot more complex where actually R&D and development is happening in the studios and it's sort of surpassing the capabilities of the institutions for sure. But not only that, but the tech companies who were like the sort of first incubators or institutions that were providing support, those companies are now benefiting off the development, the R&D and the discovery and the ways artists are pushing technology and the different kinds of possibilities they're putting out there, specifically with the net art movement, just the idea of culture and the way that artists have been creating that culture around computation and what it means to have online communities and what it means to put ideas out into an online virtual public space, right? So artist studios actually are the ones that are fueling now development cycles. So it's actually become a much more, uh, you know, there, there's not this uh, inequality in power anymore where we have the computational ability and you are the artist in your studio. Now it's like actually really reversed in most cases. Just thinking of that 
card that uh, I use to represent with, you know, EAI's announcement of a workshop to try out the Apple II computer just as it was emerging. That perfectly illustrates what you're talking about, Kalani, this totally uh, inverted relationship to technology. Now we have this term called art washing, which helps us describe <laughs> the benefit that institutions, by which I mean sort of corporations in the sense, I'm not talking about art world institutions necessarily, can benefit from their partnerships with artists. But then there's also more generally the degree to which we are now all embedded in platform capitalism, that even to be a quote unquote independent artist, releasing your AR work independently outside of a gallery or a museum still necessitates you releasing it on a platform like Instagram. Total independence as an artist is completely impossible. You know, it's sort of this situation. You're always sort of dependent upon the, either the, from anything from the networks, which we know were sort of started as a military experiment, perhaps, you know, and sort of leaked out to the public to the computers that we use, which are controlled like, well, Apple throws the app off the app store. Like you kind of have to uh, anticipate that. And one thing the web has allowed artists to do is to have more control over where the art sits. So there's a degrees of independence always and never a question of being totally independent at all. That, of course, goes to this larger question of stewardship and maybe ownership and who owns what is produced using that technology or that platform. Obviously been a question regarding software-based work for a long time. One thing that I've Really struggle with with blockchain is sort of like when the precipice and sort of the build out of nfts was starting a year or two ago people were always saying well you know once it's on the blockchain it's forever and it was like this notion of like the blockchain is permanent because it's immutable and it's like decentralized so therefore it's safe geo cities was supposed to be forever too but you know we've seen where that's gone when i've been in within the museums and the institutions and i've met with the archiving teams it's really like a very delicate process so it's about having enough work or kind of a overall like arcing canon of work in which it's institutionally valid enough that it's like worth archiving yeah i love that prompt of like is it worth archiving um, and I think that's, it's so problematic the way that that's the, that's how the power and, and the funding works right now. And I'm really interested in a reversal of that. It, it strikes me that, you know, what, what an institution also does this idea of institutional memory. It's about that behavior and that, that desire of stewardship to care for these things, right. And how that lasts through time. So when we look at decentralized technology, it could all just go away. Like every computer could go offline, right. But if there are actually still individuals stewarding data in offline ways, there are ways for humans to create new behaviors in this moment of great change that could really foster that kind of reversal in power and care. Digital art can sort of force us to invert our thinking. There's an old joke about museums being mausoleums, that we entomb works of art. But I think one of the most exciting things about digital art for institutions is that it forces us to think about art as like a living thing and not just like metaphorically, but like literally, like on a technical level, right? It's something that is constantly evolving. The ephemerality of digital art was something that artists gained, right? And it was something that institutions didn't know how to deal with. And I would argue that this illusion of immutability is the only reason we, we get to have all these conversations about digital art today, that we are, who are involved with digital art know that that's untrue and that I benefit basically from this notion that digital art can be saved and archived in any sort of eternal kind of way, which we all know is absolutely not possible. I think it's this illusion of immutability that happens right now that makes more and more institutions interested in being involved in archiving digital art at all. So you need the lie in some ways, or artists need the lie, somebody needs the lie. The lie is benefiting a lot of people. The conversation that we're having around digital art and media entering the institutions is very similar to the one about like performance entering these institutions in the same way and institutions not being able to understand that value because of the ever-changing nature, the you know disassociation from a market, the inability to archive in a correct or accurate way. So I think that institutions are really learning from all these different disciplines about how to become more flexible, more responsive, and seeing value outside of these objects. 
how can we imagine institutional support that's not predicated upon the idea of acquisition? Maybe look towards solutions like what Rhizome has come up with in terms of emulation into this idea forwarded by Johnny Polito about variable media becomes more and more important, I think. I remember when I first heard these ideas a long time ago, I thought, preposterous, you know, the code is everything, you know, but then um, the, the more time goes on, the more I think that this is an excellent strategy. The, the work needs to be performed in a sense, right? Like that beyond performance art, just media art, every time you open a file, it's performed, right? So we don't put things in a vault anymore. What if instead of like a vault or an archive, it's like a community garden, right? It's like, we're all tending to these things. We're all performing these things. We're reviving them. We're bringing back through generations. I also think a lot about the Whitney Museum's model with what it did with Douglas Davis's The World's First Collaborative Sentence from 1994. So they actually have two versions of that available on their website now, right? So there's like a historical archival version, and then there's a live version that you can actually interact with. It's equally true that you need to have an interactive experience of that work for it to make sense to you. And also that it's important to be able to access it through a kind of historical browser or historical interface and understand visually what that experience was like, you know, 25 years ago. Is accessibility um, also another thing that institutions should be thinking about? Or, you know, what are you guys' take on that idea? The um, Serpentine's Future Art Ecosystems Report, where they talk about uh, a public good and thinking about the metaverse or the sort of virtual space and all of the sort of legacy work in that format as, well, what if we reorient that and the support of that as a public good? There's something in that line of thought where we can get to a point where we're actually talking about equitable systems, about redistribution of wealth, about the kind of mechanics we're seeing in this moment actually making good on that kind of transparent public infrastructure. Which I think actually brings it back to the spirit of the late 60s, early 70s. And the excitement that didn't necessarily come to fruition around cable television and what that might offer and the interest in decentralized television. I've always thought that parallel between television and the internet is, you know, they're right next to each other. But of course, then you have to talk about the concentration of power there and the inability to escape that. Yeah. And I think a lot about, you know, just during the moment of COVID when every arts institution was moving their programming online, they're like, oh, suddenly we're accessible, right? Like we're suddenly we're, we're available to everybody, even though like we're not making any efforts to like reach out beyond our established audience that's already on our email list, or we're not uh, thinking about the ways that technology is not accessible to people. What is the role of these new kinds of born digital, like virtual um, institutions? I think for a lot of them, I'm not sure even if I know what the intentions are, because to some extent, a lot of them came to fruition, like a sort of a reactionary cash grab to what was already happening within the space and they hadn't already established a provenance with either artists or institutions they were just like using these buzzwords to essentially create sort of a false narrative of trust and i think that burned a lot of the institutional viability of both nfts and those marketplaces because of the way that they handled this emerging space and and rather than being very calculated and sort of specific and working with people who have those knowledge bases they sort of went against that in the name of profit so when we think about the preservation and longevity of digital art there is something very well set up in decentralized economies. I don't say blockchain when I talk about this because I think the moment we're at in the technology's development is so early and so awkward and everyone is so hyper-focused on scarcity and NFTs that they can't kind of see the forest through the trees. But when you think about Web3 and the changes that are coming to the world, right? The art world is the first industry that's been disrupted, but this is going to happen to every industry as well. Everyone will have this reckoning moment. So I, I really believe in the future of Web3 and what it can be. But I think it's going to take us leading from the side of cultural value and thinking about these kinds of systems within that technological framework. And everything that's happened has been the other way, as you describe it. It's technologists setting up and, and, and acting, right, um, LARPing, as they say, <laughs> um, what it means to be a museum or institution. One of the reasons I love digital art so much is because, and I hate this word, but its capacity to sort of disrupt how we, like the role that we think institutions should play the audiences we think institutions should speak to, the values that they should hold. Digital art is real art is all I'll say. I think this is an ongoing collaboration between digital artists and offline institutions. And I encourage these new digital institutions to take it all much more seriously 
and to work with the arts community writ large, you know, digital art community, and maybe even offline artists who could be brought into working in new ways.